podcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everybody. This is the Bovin webinar uh, today, and uh, this webinar will be recorded. And uh, my name is Frank Serbe. And I'm the leader of a work package, and I want to firstly introduce into Bovin, that means Beef Innovation Network Europe. Uh, this is a EU-funded pr uh, project and over three years. And the aim, oh, sorry, now, okay. And uh, Bovin has its own uh, website, you see here. And uh, if you enter this website, uh, you find the left-hand view. And Bovin is a consortium out of different partners from nine EU countries. They are included Beef associations, stakeholders, scientific institutions and universities, and also farm advisory companies and so on. And if you enter our website, you find the main four working groups named uh, one, socioeconomic resilience, animal health and welfare production efficiency and meat quality and environmental sustainability. If you click such an icon, you enter, enter the working group, you have information about the working group and uh, contact data. And uh, if you make a click on a flag of the countries, you uh, receive contact data from uh, the network, network managers in your country. And uh, yes, you can uh, take their contact to the, uh, to the persons and institutions. Yes, what uh, you have on our website also access to our uh, Bovin Knowledge Hub, uh, shown on the left-hand side. And uh, the main aim of Bovin is to share innovations and good practices. Well, we want to identify different needs of farmers and their networkers and uh, we review literature and collect innovations, and uh, these will done in four thematic areas. Uh, and we are here, uh, the technical working group, animal health and welfare. And yes, if you uh, want to enter the Bovin Knowledge Hub, then you, first you, uh, uh, you were shown the uh, registration sheet on the left-hand side, and there uh, uh, the sheet you make your data, and this must be submitted, and then you have the log in for the Knowledge Hub. <clears throat> At the Knowledge Hub, uh, there are presented different articles also for our technical working group. And here are shown the uh, four uh, yes, topics, priority topics, and uh, what uh, you can find in each folder there are different articles where you can read again about the topics and uh, you find links and also links to other articles 
or uh, to other working groups. And uh, there you can also find an article about scoring vitality in newborn coughs. And uh, this is the basis of our webinar today. Uh, and we want to have a talk on this uh, research innovation. And our webinar uh, is called Methods of Assessing the Vitality of Newborn Calves and the Benefits for Suckler Farms. And during our webinar, please use the cue box for your questions. You find it in the panel. And uh, yes, uh, we try to answer the question at the end, at the end of the webinar. Uh, the basis of our webinar is one publication, uh, Managing the Calf at Calving Time. And I'm very happy to welcome the author of the publication, John Me from Czechist. And uh, hello, John. Afternoon, Frank. Uh, hello. Uh, would you give us some short words about your person that we know where you come from and what you what you are doing? Yes, of course. Um, John Mee is my name. I'm a, a veterinary scientist working with Chagask uh, in Ireland. Chagask is our national uh, research advice and education organization dealing with agriculture. And as Frank mentioned, they're a member of the Bovine uh, Network. Uh, and in my research work, I'm a specialist in calf health. So I've spent many years working in various diseases and problems and production aspects of calf health also. So that's my background briefly. Thank you, John. You are welcome. My second partner in this webinar is Annalena Lindau. Uh, she is working at the Bundesverband Rindschwein in Germany. And she is also busy at her veterinary practice. Hello, Anna. Lena. Hello, Frank. <laughs> Would you introduce yourself also with a few words? Yes, of course. Um, well, as you said before, my name is uh, Annalena Lindo, and I'm a veterinary practitioner uh, running an own veterinary practice in Germany. And uh, I'm also um, part of the Federal Association for yeah, Beef and uh, Pigs in Germany. And in this function, I'm working in the bovine network um, and establish good practices for beef farms. Okay, thank you. You are welcome. <laughs> and uh, now so, a few words to my person. Uh, I'm Frank Zerbe, and I'm also a vet and a researcher at Friedrich Löffler Institute in Germany. Uh, I'm working at the Department Animal Husbandry and Animal Welfare. And uh, now I think we want to start our webinar. Uh, John, we want to change our screens. That is your floor. Excellent. You must close your windows, the small one. Okay, now? Yeah, thank you. Perfect. Thank you, Frank. Uh, well, the topic we're going to discuss today has numerous strands to it. But I'd like to outline, first of all, what you're going to learn by listening to Frank, Lena, and myself. The first is that you will learn something about specifically beef calf perinatal mortality, how common it is across Europe primarily. We'll also look at the key factors that reduce beef calf vitality, and we'll rank them in order of importance. We'll then answer the question, why does vitality matter? Does it matter whether a beef calf is good 
or poor vitality at birth? And then we'll answer the question, why should you, if you're a farmer, assess beef calf vitality? Is that important or not? We'll answer that question. And in doing so, we get down to the nuts and bolts of, well, how do you do that? Specifically, when can you assess beef calf vitality? And of course, the question that's most often asked in these seminars is, when should I call the vet? So we'll specifically address that question as well and answer it with specific answers. In addition, in this presentation, we'll present a new vigor scoring app developed in North America uh, as something that may be something for the future, but also for some of you, you may wish to use it now, and it is available now. And at the end of this presentation, Frank will finish up with the key take home messages, perhaps two or three things that you've learned today that you can go home and apply in your herd and on your farm. So that's what we hope to get through today. Let's start with the mortality rate of beef calves at birth. So this is within two days of birth. On average, the loss rates are reasonably low, two to 5%, but these are average national figures. So here are the national data for some countries within Europe, and you can see that they vary between about two and 5%. However, the variation between farms in each of those countries could be between zero and 25%, so much greater variation at a herd level than there is nationally. It's key to take that into account. They're the problem herds. So a key factor in discussing perinatal mortality is that the majority, over three quarters of the calves that will die in the perinatal period were alive at the start of calving. So that means for you, this is preventable loss. They spent nine months during their pregnancy getting to this point, so they are alive. And if they die in the next two days, then that's preventable. That's key. And the reason we put mortality in the opening slide is because the same factors which cause mortality cause poor vitality. So essentially, this is an iceberg condition. If you see mortality in a herd, it means that that's just the tip of the iceberg. Below the water in a herd with high mortality is poor calf vitality. So they're both inextricably linked. Okay, so let's look at the factors causing poor calf vitality. And you perhaps don't use the term poor calf vitality. You may describe it as the weak calf or weak calf syndrome or the at-risk calf. This is the calf that's at risk of dying due to what happened during the perinatal period. Or in some countries, they call them dummy calves, stupid calves. So the number one factor associated with poor calf vitality are calving problems, specifically calvings that are too long, calvings that have excessive trauma to the calf, calvings in which the calf is malpresented, in which there may be a uterine torsion, or there had to be a cesarean section, or the calving was induced, or the placenta parted separation early during calving, or there was an accident with the umbilical cord. So numerous problems that occur at calving are the primary causes of a weak calf at birth, but they're not the only causes. There are infections which occur in utero during the pregnancy. They may cause a placentitis or they may infect the fetus. And there are also infections that occur after the calf is born. So these we describe as if they infect many organs as a septicemia, but they may affect specific organs, such as the lungs causing pneumonia, so they also cause weak calves. In addition, conditions which may predispose to infections, for example, could be trace element disorders, and these are not in common in systems that rely on a pasture-based diet. And not uncommonly, you would find iodine deficiency, selenium deficiency, perhaps less common manganese. And also on an individual cow basis, you may get intrauterine growth retardation. Cows in very poor body condition during pregnancy, producing small, weak calves at birth. Genetics can also have a role to play. So specific breeds or crossbreeds can have more or less vital calves or specific sires 
within a breed can produce calves that have greater or lesser vitality and the per predicted transmitting ability of the sire is a guide to its ability to produce vital calves. And of course, occasionally we have inherited congenital defect, deformed calves at birth. It might be they might have contracted tendons or whatever, some defect that reduces the vitality at birth. And again, for outdoor management systems, management systems at grass, the weather has a major role to play. So calves that are born into an environment where they have hypothermia shortly after birth that's not resolved are going to be weaker after birth. And to a small extent, the technopathies are relevant. So calves born indoor on very slippy floors will find it very difficult to stand up and get a suck quickly after birth. So they're at risk of subsequent issues. And occasionally, there will be accidents caused by stomach tubing where, where the colostrum is placed in the lungs of the calf and calves will die because of that. So, so, so they're minor issues. So you can see the ranking of important issues is as shown on the slide. And that's illustrated really well here in this Canadian research on beef calf vitality and comparing it with the degree of difficulty at calving. And you can see clearly that as the difficulty of calving increases, the vigor of the calf decreases. So the more difficult the calving, the less vital the calf is going to be. And if we ask the question, but how does that happen? How does a difficult calving cause a weak calf? Well, this is the basic pathophysiology of what happens during a difficult calving. So as you can see in the top, during a difficult calving, you'll have prolonged and frequent uterine contractions. You'll have separation of the placenta, sometimes prematurely, sometimes it's infected. You will have occlusion of the umbilical cord, and sometimes there'll be accidents with that cord. It may be wrapped around the hind leg of a calf, it may be wrapped around the neck of a calf. And all of these factors contribute to reducing the blood flow through the umbilical cord to the calf in utero. And when that happens, the calf has a lower blood oxygen saturation, and a higher blood carbon dioxide content. And the result of this respiratory acidosis is it leads to anaerobic glycolysis in the tissues and excessive production of lactic acid. And the result of both of these features, the respiratory acidosis and the metabolic acidosis, is what's described as the weak calf syndrome. And if these conditions are prolonged and or severe, it can result in the death of the calf. So that's essentially how a newborn calf becomes weak immediately after birth due to these physiological factors occurring during a difficult calving. So we go back and ask the question, why does calf vitality matter? <clears throat> does it matter whether a calf is weak or not at birth? It, it, it does. So vital calves will stand up unassisted quicker. So their inherent vitality means they will stand quicker. And we know the importance of that. It means they will be quicker to get their first suck or to attempt to get their first suck. And this is obviously critically important if you're not present at the calving. An unobserved, unassisted calving relies on the calf being vital and being able to stand up and suck without assistance. Additionally, calves that don't go through a difficult calving and are vital at birth will absorb more antibodies from the colostrum because they'll have suffered less damage to the lining of their bowel due to the hypoxia that occurs during that prolonged birth. And if they are vital and they've stood up quickly and they've sucked quickly, then they're going to be at lower risk of all of the common conditions that occur in the newborn calf, such as navel ill, diarrhea, pneumonia, and ultimately more mortality. And the end result of all of this is that a vital calf will have a higher average daily gain and be a more profitable animal in the herd subsequently. So in answer to the question, does calf vitality matter? You can see clearly it matters with an economic bottom line. So if that's the answer to does vitality matter, the next question, well, does assessment of vitality matter, which is a totally separate question. So what does it do? Essentially, it allows you to predict, to treat, and to prevent. So as regards prediction, it allows you to predict that a calf is going to be weak 
during and after birth, and this can allow you to decide whether or when you'll call your vet in advance of the problem occurring, not after the problem has occurred. It allows you to treat the at-risk calves promptly and correctly because you've assessed their vitality and determined that they require this therapy. And as I've said previously, if you detect and then you treat, you will prevent. So the problems of navel ill, diarrhea, and pneumonia that are related to poor vitality at birth can be prevented if you assess that vitality at birth. And in retrospect, your assessment of your calf's vitality assists your veterinary practitioner if they have to investigate an outbreak of weak calf syndrome in your herd. So as a retrospective tool, the records you create in assessing calf vitality are vitally important to your veterinary practitioner's investigation of the problems in your herd. So if we've decided that calf vitality is important, an assessment of calf vitality important, the next question obviously is, well then, how do you do it? Well, let's start with when do you do it? So you can assess calf vitality during calving. And I've written here on the slide that if you're not there, you don't care. So you obviously have to be at the calving. And by calving, I'm talking about stage two, when the calf is being born. You can also assess calf vitality immediately after the calf is born. And there are three simple categories. Either it's a very vital, strong calf, it's a weak calf, or it's dead. And it is advisable to reassess the calf within about 15 minutes of birth. And we'll discuss which are the best ways to do that. And the suck reflex is an excellent method of doing that. And the reason these assessments are important is that you have what I describe as the golden hour. The first hour of the calf's life determines the success of its life. So during this period, you need to rapidly assess the need for therapy and respond rapidly. So during this time, you'll assess calf vitality. You may or may not, depending on what you find, initiate resuscitation, apply umbilical antisepsis, feed colostrum, and insert identity tags in the calf. So all of this is done. And the real point here is the timing of what you do is as important as what you actually do. So timing matters. Okay, so let's start during calving. So we have a cow that's calving, the calf is not yet out. What can we learn about the vitality of the, that calf before it's born? So these are the visible criteria that you can assess without any equipment or tools. All that's required is knowledge and experience. So if we start with the water bag, so this is technically the second water bag or the, the amnion. The characteristics you see in that water bag give you a guide as to what has happened during that calving. So we expect it to be translucent, but if the water in the bag is brown, it indicates meconium staining. This indicates a stress in the calf during birth. If it's red, it suggests that there's been hemorrhage during the birth. So this may suggest that some of the placenta has separated or a lot has separated. If you see cotyledons coming with the water bag, this tells you the placenta is already separating prematurely. And if when the water bag breaks or you break it, the liquid in the bag is fetid, there's a bad odor, this indicates that this calf is probably already dead. So all of that information just by assessing the water bag. If we then move on to the fetus, the best in indication of fetal vitality are its reflexes. And of those reflexes, the best reflex to assess is the pedal reflex, because this response best is most sensitive to acidosis in the fetus. So this basically is essentially pinching between the claws of the front or the hind feet and the calf and seeing is there a withdrawal reflex or not. And the absence of withdrawal reflex is a poor indicator of vitality. One can also use ocular and anal reflexes also. Similarly, with the head of the calf, poor indicators of vitality would be a reddened muzzle, 
swollen head, a firm, dark, long tongue, and cyanotic or dark gums. And I'll illustrate some of those in the next slide. And with the legs of the fetus, if they're immobile, swollen, stained yellow brown, or cold or dry, all of these, and particularly in combination, are an indication that this calf is likely to have poor vitality once it's born. So you're assessing all this even before the calf has come out of the cow. So this is the water bag, and this is a perfectly normal water bag that you'd use as a baseline against which to compare an abnormal water bag. And these are calves in the cow at birth, or, or the feet in the cow at birth, that you can use to assess the vitality of the calf. So if we take this photograph here, this calf has been in the cow calving for six hours. And at this point, some of the criteria we just mentioned are clear in the calf. So the tongue is enlarged, swollen, hard, and dark. The feet are enlarged and they're stained with this yellow fluid, which is the feces of the calf. So the calf has excreted its own feces during stage one of calving and has coated these, the, the feet of the calf, indicating the calf is stressed. On the right hand side of the slide, you'll see this purple discoloration of the gums of the calf, and this is cyanosis in the newborn calf. While on the left, you'll see this enlarged tongue and swollen head on the calf, again indicating prolonged, difficult calving, and will result in either a less vital calf or, in this case, a dead calf. So, if we now move to after calving, the calf is born. So, what criteria can we use then? So on the left are the criteria and the zero or the 15 indicates zero, which is at birth or 15 minutes within 15 minutes of birth. So respiration is the first thing to assess in the newborn calf. And it will take a calf a few seconds only to start breathing. And after that, it should assume regular breathing. But if it's gasping, has an irregular frequency or intensity or is bellowing, all of these are an indication of poor vitality. I've mentioned the mucous membranes. Cyanosis is not uncommon. On occasion, you can have pallor. So these are extremely white mucous membranes, the eye or the gums. This indicates the calf has bled. There is a lack of blood in the calf for whatever reason. The heart rate can also be checked. And in simple terms, it can be weak or regular, slow or absent. Uh, you can record the actual heart rate itself by placing your hand on the left-hand side of the calf's chest beneath the elbow and record over 15 seconds what the heart rate is and multiply by four. The muscle tone is also a good indicator. So flaccidity of the muscle or inactivity of the calf are poor indicators of vitality. And Highlighted in bold are one of the best indicators, which is the tongue pinch withdrawal reflex or the suck response. Good recent Canadian research has shown this to be a very good indicator of subsequent ability of the calf to consume an adequate volume of colostrum. So where the suck response is poor, delayed or absence, it's unlikely this calf will spontaneously consume an adequate volume of colostrum. Another indicator is lateral recumbence. So calf will be born and will be in lateral recumbence initially, but if this is prolonged, and by prolonged, I mean more than approximately five minutes, that's an indicator that the vitality of the calf is poor. And the longer it spends in lateral recumbence, the worse its vitality. And as well as looking at a calf's vitality, we can access, uh, access, assess the degree of maturity of the calf, which is independent but related to vitality on occasion by looking at its teeth, its hair coat, skull doming, its size, whether it's defects, and whether it's respiratory distress syndrome. So we can assess, is this a full-term calf or not? So as I mentioned, the suck reflex is a really good indicator of, is this a vital calf or not? So basically, simply putting two or three fingers into a calf's mouth and seeing how well, if at all, the calf sucks your fingers is a very good way to check 
is this calf vital and can it and will it consume colostrum of its own accord after calving? And the recumbence of the calf that I mentioned, lateral recumbence is not a good sign of a calf, whereas the calf that's shown on the screen is in what's described as the dog sitting position. It's in sternal recumbence. And this is the way a calf should be positioned immediately after calving on all occasions. And this prevents what's described as hypostatic congestion. That is a calf that lies on its side, pools blood in its lower lung, so is less efficient at breathing in both of its lungs. So all calves immediately after birth should be placed in this sternal recumbence position. So that's a, a brief uh, run through the basics of assessing the vitality of the calf after birth. And I'll hand back to Frank now. Uh, okay, thank you very much, John. <clears throat> I think it's important in your uh, presentation that oh, moment that that the farmer should use the the golden hour uh, for assessing calf fertility. That is important. Okay, we go to the next slide. When should I call my vet? Um, <clears throat> yes, uh, there is low risk calving if you have a natural cow or uh, you know that uh, uh, the cow has easy carvings and there are also uh, thyas with short gestation that the calf may be smaller. And uh, it is very important, as uh, John already told us, um, that the calf uh, sit up and come in the sternal recumbents within a short time after birth. You should call the vet uh, before the calf is born if you know that you have a higher risk. For instance, that is a hypha, and you perhaps use a, a, a stock bull for breeding. And if you see that the legs are very, uh, very big of the calf, and there is no progress in calf uh, in calving, but the calf is still alive, then you should call the vet before the calf is born. And after the calf is born, uh, the calf must lift the head and uh, sit up. And uh, there is uh, heavy breathing by the calf or the swollen tongue as shown. And uh, for instance, that the dam is showing no interest in the calf, then you should uh, the vet. Uh, Annalena, uh, I want to hear what is your experience uh, on bee farm? How important is it uh, to have the assessment by the farmer and which criteria are important for the vet to hear? Um, yes, uh, thank you for the question. Um, in my experience, well, first of all, most farmers are very responsible because, of course, they want their calves to live. Um, but uh, nevertheless, um, I experience it quite regularly that um, I'm uh, called if there's quite a prolonged um, birth um, or the, yeah, when the, um, the calf is too long in the cow, let's say it like this. Um, most farmers, in my experience, try to manage themselves first and they manage quite uh, or they try quite long. They try to uh, to do birth ex uh, assistance and um, many of them do it quite well. But still, my um, my experience is that they try too long sometimes um, when the calf is too big, when the calf isn't uh, lying right. For example, when a leg is flexed or something, um, 
they tried too long to manage this themselves and um, often I wish they would have called a bit earlier maybe then they should have been done something about it um, so this is the first thing so this before the calf is born this is something um, I it was it would be my request um, to um, manage this a bit more careful uh, before the calf is born um, for example I've in my experience, I've never been called because a high risk calving was expected. Um, okay. But sometimes during calving, when there's just no progress whatsoever. And um, after the calf is born, um, I'm called much quicker. Uh, the farmers notice quite quick if the calf is able to live or not, or if, if it needs help. Um, but I think it would be very, very helpful to assess many of these criteria John mentioned before, because of course, when I'm called, it's uh, very helpful for me uh, to know what I expect when I arrive there. So I can, um, or I have an idea what is expecting me. So I can um, prepare medication, I can prepare tools I need, um, and I don't have to assess the whole thing myself first. That's, that just takes time. So if the farmer would be able to assess those um, criteria and tell me about it uh, when he calls me, this would be quite a big help and save meant much time, of course. Okay, I think that's very important uh, that the farmer know that the wet must be prepared when he arrives the farm. And um, uh, I have an additional question. Um, um, what uh, kind of recommendation we have when the carving takes place at pasture? Uh, what when the carving takes place again at pasture? Sorry, is it sound? Wait. No, it was a bit, bit uh, disrupted. Sorry. Okay, uh, when the carving takes place on pasture, what are our recommendations for the farmers? Uh, okay, mm, yeah, that's of course sometimes a bit difficult in beef cattle, of course. Um, not in all of them, but sometimes they are a bit uh, harder to handle than dairy cows, for example. Um, it's always important to have um, to have the possibility to fixate the cow so that you really can take care of the calf um, or to assist in calving uh, as a start. Um, and of course that, um, I have to say that we have all the tools necessary there. Um, yeah. If you're in the stables, you have all the tools at hand mostly. Yeah. Um, but of course uh, on the pasture, uh, they can be quite uh, quite wide uh, yeah far away okay. so um, it's important that you have all the needed tools uh, I don't know in a box in in one corner that you ha just have to grab it and get it there uh, so yeah. that you don't lose additional time and as I said most important for me is that I can get to the cow that I can get to the calf um, to be able to help yeah That's, uh, okay. and also for safety reasons of course that uh, um, the other cows aren't surrounding nearby and everything, so a um, bit of safety is also very important. Yes. It is also important to monitor the time when the birth start. That is also a problem, yes. So we yes. recommend that uh, the carvings take place in, in the barn and uh, uh, so it's also easier for the vet to intervene. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, important point, yes. Yeah, okay. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> now, <clears throat> now I want to show you uh, some, some videos uh, about postnatal assessment of vitality. And as uh, John already shown, uh, the absence of hypoxia and acidosis are good predictors of calf vitality. And the willingness and motivation of the calm to get up and suck a colostrum. 
and uh, here you can see uh, uh, suckling motivation uh, it is recommended uh, that the calves show uh, about 80 beats per minute sucking beats and that the uh, uh, first colostrum intake is within the two hours postpartum and to the respiration there is recommended about 50 to 75 beats per minute mainly thoracic breathing and but you can see here a slight dominal abdominal uh, breathing that is regular but uh, if the abdominal breathing is harder then uh, the calf has a possible problem with the respiration okay yes uh, now we want to go to uh, a recommendation uh, uh, about uh, the calf Vega scorer. Uh, this uh, scorer was developed by the University of Wisconsin School of Veterinary Medicine. And uh, the Vega scorer is similar to the APCA scoring system, which was used in humans. And uh, the Vega scorer, scorer on your mobile phone, uh, you can use it for documentation and to share the data with your vet or consultant. And uh, there is a, a summarizing of points. And if you have uh, 26 to 27 points, then uh, uh, it is excellent and below 17 the vigor uh, of the calf is too low and uh, you can uh, see here the different criteria uh, which was assessed uh, and uh, John told us that he was involved in the development a little bit for the Sviga scorer. What are the advantages of the Sviga scorer? John? Uh, yes, Frank. Um, I, I suppose I should clarify, I, I was not involved in the development of this score. I've done research in this field, but this these data came from um, a Canadian PhD and have subsequently been developed in the okay. University of Wisconsin. So, so it, it, I, I've not been involved in it. But, um, I think it's an excellent addition um, to the armory of both the farmer and the veterinarian because we're so used to using apps on our phone for wearable technologies in ourselves that I think increasingly in the future we will want to use apps to monitor the health of our animals and this is a very good start. It's the only one I know in existence so I think it would be useful for a farmer who is um, tech savvy and wants to record data on each individual animal to build up a database on their farm of the vigor score of their calves. They may never need to use this, but in a year where there's a problem, they may be able to look back on their data and find that all of the poor vigor score calves, for example, came from particular bulls or occurred at weekends or occurred at night or occurred when certain staff were assisting the cows to calve. So they can use this as a database to interrogate and investigate the problem on their farm. And of course, if they share that with their practicing veterinarian, they can then engage with their veterinarian using data on calf vigor on their own farm. So I think in that way, um, to me, it's a potentially excellent tool for that use. And Lena probably has comments from a, a practitioner's perspective. Uh, yes, I have. I um, This Vigo scorer was quite new to me as well, I, I have to admit, but I tested it for a time now and I really do like it. I really would recommend to use it, <laughs> definitely. It's quite easy to use and um, everyone attending here who's from Germany, this is uh, also in, this app is also available in German, so um, there shouldn't be a problem. Um, 
and the interface is exactly like you see it here. Um, you can can enter uh, different herds. You can enter the calf IDs, um, and uh, when you uh, move those uh, bullets uh, on the scale, where you have those uh, different criteria, um, you have, uh, for example, three different uh, steps for this criteria. And if you move this bullet uh, on the screen, um, the description of the criteria appears uh, above it. So you um, know exactly what you are selecting. And as you see above, there's a total score for this calf. Um, and uh, there's a legend in this app where you can see what this score means. If, if this calf has a poor vitality if, or if it's a strong calf or anything. And as John said, it's an excellent tool to uh, evaluate all the births in one herd in all of your herds. You can. Um, you can get this this data summarized for yourself. You can send it by email to your vet. So um, I think this is a really useful um, tool. Uh, the only two really, really small critics I found <laughs> is um, in the practical use. For me, just a small remark. This shouldn't be uh, this shouldn't be the criteria uh, to use it or not. I found it quite difficult because when you do birth uh, assistant when you do um, uh, when you are assessing vitality in calves you just get dirty hands it's like it is <laughs> and to touch your screen with it might be difficult but maybe uh, next to good hygiene this is uh, another argument for gloves so uh, not so bad and uh, in this app there is no kind of um, advisement uh, of course what do I do if I have poor vitality in calves. It's just a status you have there. There's no uh, advice on what to do. So you really have to discuss this with uh, with your vet uh, that you even know when the score is beneath this level, you should call your vet or if or you can develop maybe a kind of um, kind of uh, yeah. Um, yeah, operation procedure, uh, depending on the score, what the farmer has to do uh, when the score is on this or this level. So, um, but uh, really, I think this is a very, very useful app um, for for the single calf to uh, score vitality and of course for the entire herd to evaluate and to, um, yeah, optimize your management and carvings. Okay, thank you. Um... The, um, the picture below, uh, which you see that uh, is uh, included by John, uh, if you have a dark calf and you want to uh, control if there is much meconium, then you can use a white sheet that is included. Uh, Yes, and now we are at uh, the take home messages. And uh, these messages from us that means that you, uh, you, uh, that if you have carving probe, uh, that carving problems are the primary causes of poor calf vitality, and that especially prolonged and difficult car carvings contribute to poor vitality of the calf. And the second is that you should assess vitality during and after carving. During carving mainly by reflexes and after carving the sucking reflex is uh, important especially that uh, the calf ingest colostrum because the resorption of antibodies, colostrum antibodies are closed after 24 hours. And third, uh, if you assess vitality uh, and you do that very well, then you prevent calf diseases and mortality and follow your veterinarian's advice uh, for calf care and 
uh, I hope then you on the good side and uh, yes all together here below the information of John me again if you have question to him and I hope that uh, it's okay and now we want to go to the oh yeah there is a picture again okay and now we go to uh, the question and i hope there are many questions in the q box uh, Rhonda, can you give us more information at the moment uh, there are no questions in the q box um you've obviously covered a great deal of ground here for the people attending the webinar um i have one question uh, regarding the available uh, availability of the app. Um, it's in English and German only at the moment. Is that right? Uh, John, I don't know if you have further information there um, in German. It's for sure in English too. I don't know about other languages. Uh, nor do I, to be honest. No, I don't know. Um, I, okay. I would say simply Google it and you'll find find details yeah yeah yes yeah okay yeah. and yeah. and there's no charge at all it's it's literally a free uh, scoring system uh actually there was a charge um it was in in euros it was uh 350 i think so it's okay. not that much no okay i think everyone should afford this uh in exchange for healthy calves yes mm. uh, there don't seem to be any questions coming through so uh i think we are in time yes one hour and then i think we come to the uh, end uh we oh. have one question yes okay uh, do you recommend calf starter tubes after carving john will you try uh, I, i'm not clear if that means calf stomach tube or starter tube i'm not clear what a starter tube is mm -hmm. it, it's, it's not a term we use so okay T turu could you, you have any idea? Hmm? so it could be a misprint on, on stomach tube rather than starter tube the only other starter tube i can think of is that occasionally there are liquid pastes that are put in a very large syringe that you give orally to a calf immediately after it's born. That may be called a starter tube, but, but I'm not clear. It's difficult to answer if I don't know the question. Mm. It may be a language issue. Perhaps if the person wants to put it in their own language and Frank could, could translate. Yeah, no. um, has any research been done on finding out specific causes of poor calf vitality. Well, obviously, your presentation did cover quite a, a range of this, but I think perhaps somebody is asking for uh, more references regarding research on poor calf vitality. Yeah, um, yes. the, the answer is yes. Um, there are numerous studies conducted um, on calf vitality and using numerous very detailed scoring systems to assess calf vitality, both physiologically and the behavior of the calf. So looking at blood gas analysis and how long it takes a calf to stand or to suck, and then what effect various treatments or risk factors have on those outcome variables. So if the questioner uh, has specific questions on that, please send me an email, I can forward lots of papers on specific aspects of research on calf vitality. Thank you, John. When we send um, a um, an email to all attendees, we'll include that in our email and your email address, if that's OK. Yeah, uh, fine, fine. Lovely. One more question. What is the best way to reduce tongue swelling in a calf that has been calving for a prolonged period? Is that a difficult question? No, no. Lena, do you want to go first? 
Um, I think this is uh, for this question uh, means if the calf is born and has a swollen tongue, if I understand this right. Um, yes, Lena. Yes, okay. Um, I usually use uh, dexamethasone um, for quick, uh, well, down swelling now, how is it called? Um, so uh, that the tongue gets uh, to his, its normal yeah. size as quickly as possible. Um, but you have to use the right dosage and um, I uh, apply it uh, into the veins of the calf so that it's, it qu quickly reaches its a target, um, but it's important to uh, to assist the calf during. I mean, this this doesn't go immediately, so there's still a time between application of the medicine and uh, normal uh, size of the tongue. So it's important to assist the calf uh, to uh, to breathe still uh, until it can breathe normally on its own. So, so this is something that actually is you should call the vet for. Yes, definitely. Yeah, uh, where well, this is, yeah, if the calf's uh, born already, uh, this can be too late. So this is why John uh, stresses so much that you should assess vitality in calves during birth. Um, mostly if the tongue is swollen after birth, it can be seen also during birth that it starts to swell. Um, so this is really important that you call the vet uh, before the calf is born. Um, yeah, if I can add, if I can yeah. add to that, Lena, um, the, the the primary reason farmers are concerned about a swollen tongue is that the calf with the swollen tongue can't suck, so that's their real concern yeah. because they just can't manipulate their tongue. When, as I mentioned, it's very long, it's very hard, and as you've seen, very swollen. True, so, yeah. so the calf may be alive, but and can stand, but they just cannot suck the cow, particularly cows that have abnormal teeth, very large pendulous teeth or very small teeth in a heifer. They just can't grasp them with their tongue because they can't create the suction in their mouth, the negative yeah. pressure. So that's the biggest concern of the farmer. And um, traditional remedies such as putting salt on the tongue to, to use osmotic pressure to reduce the size of the tongue, that would be a traditional remedy um, and okay. are, are, are fine for, for very little swelling of the tongue. But the cases you're talking about, um, that that will have no effect at all. So the key things would be one to detect it early that it is swollen and not leave a calf with a cow unable to suck. So to make a diagnosis, the cow the calf is a swollen tongue, and then to immediately milk out the cow and stomach tube the calf the colostrum. Don't rely on the calf's tongue to resolve in time. Give the colostrum early and allow the tongue to reduce in size over time or better still, call the vet, as you say, to that calf, because the calf that has a swollen tongue also more than likely <clears throat> has acidosis. The two go together. So in that case, the vet may be both able to treat the swollen tongue, as you've identified and specified, but they may also decide that the re this calf requires sodium bicarbonate or some other therapy for a lactic acidosis. So the benefit in this case is make a quick diagnosis as a farmer, give first aid therapy, and call in your veterinarian for the prolonged treatment that that calf also requires. Okay. Yeah, yeah, and that's fact, a good point. I, I just assumed the <clears throat> tongue was so small and the calf is, isn't even able to breathe, but of course there are uh, different, uh, yeah, different stages of swollen tongue. So of course that's what you yeah, said. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> in, in fact, there was a follow-up question about bicarbonate, which you've now answered. Uh, one more question. I think probably this has to be the last. How should farmers fix calving cows on the pasture, which you mentioned, Lena, particularly from a health and safety viewpoint? And the question yeah. is asking, do you have some good examples? Um, yes, one good example would be, uh, I really don't know the English word for it. It's uh, it's a kind of uh, uh, yeah cage or wagon you can uh, pull behind your tractor. I don't know the English word for it. Uh, mm -hmm. To be honest, a um, horse box, perhaps. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, a, a trailer or a box? You mean? Uh, that yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. 
right there are special trailers or boxes where you can, uh, that you can just drive onto the pasture um, and get the cow into this even if you can't touch the cow at first but at least you have it in a smaller room where you may be able to fixate it uh, um, somehow uh, and of course you can use some metal panels uh, most uh, farmers have those panels you can either build a small coral of it or you can um, you can also um, yeah, put a few panels together and um, put one inside it where you can fixate the cow between two panels that there is no real space to move for the cow. Um, always depending on, on the character of the cow, of course, but those are good uh, methods, I think, to fixate cows on pasture. We can work with, you can reach the cow, but you have um, smaller, yeah. Um, okay. Thank, you. Thank you. More security, yeah. Uh, there's one, uh, we will make this one the last one, a specific question about Belgian blue newborn calves. Do you think these criteria, i.e. the one shown on the score and the ones you've spoken about, also fit for Belgian blue newborn calves? After the cesarean section? Yeah, the, the, the Belgian blue calf is different from a lot of other calves because genetically it differs and it has the double muscling. So as Frank has just mentioned briefly, um, it's more likely to have had a cesarean derived birth than any other breed perhaps. Um, but also um, physiologically, the Belgian blue is different in that it's, it's lung functional capacity per unit of body weight is lower than an equivalent other animal. And also research in Belgium indicates that the Belgian blue suffers from a syndrome I mentioned briefly there, respiratory distress syndrome in greater numbers than other breeds perhaps do. So there are many issues with the Belgian blue that differ from an equivalent size of beef calf. So it does have major challenges at birth. Um, so the question then is whether the criteria that we've mentioned apply also to the Belgian blue. So I'd firstly say the principles definitely apply. So all of what we said about other breeds apply to the Belgian blue, but the application of them will differ because if a calf is born after a cesarean compared to a calf that's born per vaginum, then its physiology at birth will differ and its response times post birth will differ also, whether it's Belgian blue or not. So what I would suggest is that if, for example, you're using the Vigor Score app, um, you, you would have set points for a Belgian blue herd that might be different from a herd that's using Hereford or Angus or some other breed. So I think a person who's using it would want to tailor it and set baselines for their own breed and herd, because the data in that app were primarily gathered in dairy calves and not Belgian blue calves, to my knowledge. So if you're going to use it, you would perhaps have to specify what's the baseline for your breed in your herd. Mm -hmm. Good. Um, there's one comment which I will uh, share with you. Congratulations. Uh, one of the attendees writes, the webinar has been very interesting indeed at a farm level. A vital point to remind us to test in our farms. Thanks a lot. Okay. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. And uh, yes, our last slide. Uh, here you, uh, I want to show you again our uh, website name. And uh, there you are invited to join our mailing list. Uh, uh, we are the Govin Hub registration, and you also can uh, can con have contact to the network managers in your relevant country. I want to thank Minerva for the organization of the webinar, to my partners John and Lena. Thank you very much, and I want to thank the audience for your attention. Thank you very much and goodbye ever.
and we will see us. Uh, our next Bovin webinar will be in May. And uh, there were a presentation of the technical working group, uh, social, no, no uh, sustain, environmental sustainability. Okay, see you next and goodbye to all. Bye bye. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you.